Discerning of spirits, often we use it on everyone else but ourselves. I want to actually read like eight verses from 1 Corinthians and talk about how Paul wrote something. I think it will help us apply discernment uh, to ourselves instead of to everyone else. Because it's easy to apply what you think is right to everyone else, but in our life is not right. It's easy for me to tell everyone what they're doing wrong. It's easy. Anyone can do it. But it's hard for me to do everything right. It's easy to see what people aren't doing right. It's hard for me to do what is right. And so I think that we have, we have some, some small misunderstandings. And I think God wants to bring understanding where there is no understanding. Because we can't really bear fruit in areas in our life if there's not understanding. 1 Corinthians 2, 8-16 through 16. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us. Why do we receive the Holy Spirit? That we would know what Jesus paid for. Everything Jesus paid for to give us in the kingdom was purchased on the tree. The price that He paid on the cross determines our value in the kingdom. The revelation of the cross that we walk in is the understanding that we'll operate in within the kingdom. This is a huge thing. It says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is an, an, a, 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 oh my gosh. The question here, he says something so crazy. He says, who has the mind of the Lord? Who's going to instruct the Lord? But he says, no, you have the mind of Christ, meaning the Lord's here to instruct you. And the instruction is from the inside out, not from the outside in. The witness of the Spirit is given to us so that we would know everything that Jesus has prepared for us. Sometimes we miss the very reason Jesus gave His Spirit up. The reason that Jesus gave His Spirit, He offered His Spirit up, is so that we would know what He has for us. That's not self-seeking. We have to live from who we are, not live to prove who we are. Because of who Jesus was, He lived how He lived. Because of who Jesus was, He died. Because we have to live from sonship. We have to live, I do not live from my circumstances. I live at my circumstances. I live above my circumstances. And there's days in our life where our circumstances are just not favorable. There's days where I lay on the floor and cry and say, God, if you don't show up, we're, we're done. And I understand that, but we are not supposed to, as believers in Jesus, we are not supposed to live equal to our circumstances. We're supposed to live above them. Right. Or else the blood of Jesus was shed in vain. Come on. Now, Paul, and if we're going to continue here, um, Paul in, in Philippians, this is the only church that supported him when he was in prison. He said one of the most profound things. I, I mean, this is amazing, so I'm going to read it. It's just a couple verses. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ, 
Meaning, on the inside of Paul, even though he was in prison, there was a longing for the church. He loved the people of God. He loved them from, from a place of sincerity. And he says, In this I pray that your love would abound more and more in all knowledge and judgment. But the word judgment isn't judgment. It's actually discernment. What does this mean? It means the more love we really have, the more discernment we walk in. Because when you're pure in heart, you can see God. And when you're pure in heart, you can see reality for what reality is. The more pure you are, the more you see things. The more contaminated your spirit is, the less you can discern, the more dull you are. The more you walk in holiness and in the fear of God and in righteousness, according to the Spirit, according to the Scriptures, by the Spirit of God, the more you can see black and white and see reality. The more you can see what's really going on in love. Our discernment is sharpened. And as our discernment is sharpened, what's happening here is that we approve the things that are excellent. Meaning, we get what we're supposed to do. It becomes more clear. And that says that you may be sincere without offense. What the word sincere there means, it actually means that you would be uh, like tested. And that you would be approved. And it actually, the word there is that you would be judged by sunlight. And it's interesting how people that are pure or people who are sincere, it actually also, the other word uh, actually means in Greek, it means genuine. And it's like, you're like not the fake, you're the real thing. And then it says that people that are the real thing, they're, they're, they are like without offense. There's so much on discernment. I mean, we could really stay here um, for a while. But here's another thing. Uh, I found this in the Libronics Library. Um, it says, for they shall see God, and it's referring to the pure in heart. It says, once more, we would point out that the promises attached to the Beatitudes have both present and future fulfillment. The pure in heart possesses spiritual discernment with the eyes of their understanding. They obtain clear views of the divine character and perceive the excellencies of his attributes. When the eye is single, the whole body is full of light. Meaning, if all we're focusing on is the Lord, we'll be full of revelation. There's a lot here. I really believe that we have in the body of Christ, we have a false concept of love. And especially in, in the West and in America. And this false concept of love makes a lot of us blind. Because it said, basically what it says is, if you see reality for what reality is, you're not loving. And that's not true. There has to be a discerning of spirits. And if we're going to operate in the spiritual gift properly, as mature believers, the first place discernment of spirits has to operate is in our own life. In my new book, uh, the, the book on the cross, um, the, um, the execution of Jesus Christ, towards the end of it, I talk about the, the church of Revelation. And I talk about how they discern, I believe it was, um, I forget which church, but they discern that there was false apostle, it was Ephesus. Um, in Ephesus, he said, you know, you discern those who are false apostles, which means you have discernment. Discernment is functioning because you can discern false apostles, which is great. Discernment should flow. But the part is, the part of where the hypocrisy is, is that they couldn't discern that they had lost their first love and left their first works. Why? Because the seducing spirit came and they took their eyes off Jesus and put them on people. And Jesus is saying, it's pretty interesting how you can see that they're not real, but neither are you. This I have against you. That church... Uh, he says, if you don't repent, I'll remove the lampstand. Turkey is, modern day, is Ephesus, and it's 99.2% Muslim. One church that didn't repent. So how big is discernment? Discernment is huge, but where is the first place discernment should function? In me. For me. Not for you. Because if I want to be a hypocrite, then I can have discernment operating and looking at your shortcomings. But if I want to walk in truth, discernment has to function in my life first. Amen. 
I have to be more, more concerned with my issues that are holding me back from Jesus and holding me from my destiny than your issues. This is huge. Do you understand? The log is bigger than the speck. One day I was praying, the Lord said, Adam, maybe if you take the log out of your eye, you can see me. And I find it interesting that the guy with the log in their eye is focusing on the guy with the speck. He's actually more concerned with, with, with a smaller problem than the very problem he has. That's the nature of hypocrisy. And what hypocrisy does is it causes spiritual blindness. Jesus came to the, to the Pharisees and he said to them, How is it that you can discern the, the, the sky and you can know it when the wind blows and when the rain's going to come, but you can't discern the times, that you can't discern who I am. You can't see me and I'm standing in front of you. Everything you've ever read about your whole life, he's standing right here. But you can't see him. Why? Because they were hypocrites. And what does hypocrisy do? It creates spiritual blindness. And there's no discernment where there's blindness. But the first place we have to see is right here. If every one of us would take responsibility for our own issues and, and say, you know what, we're going to mature and we're going to walk in the destiny that God has, all the things around us would start coming into alignment. But when everyone focuses on everyone else, no one goes anywhere. I refuse to live like that. It's so important that we learn how to keep our focus on the things that need to be focused on. That doesn't mean we don't hold people accountable, and that doesn't mean that we live lawlessly, and it doesn't mean that we have no accountability. It means our first priority is for us to be right. I cannot spend all my energy on making you right, or making anyone else right, or forcing you to make the right decisions. I can only do what's right in God's sight and hope that people follow. Yes, we can hold people accountable, and yes, we should. And there's not a lot of that in the body of Christ, and there needs to be more of that, and I don't even argue with that. I, I, I fully believe that. But the first thing's first, and I think it's the main, the main thing here is that our life is in order. Does that make sense? Okay. You guys love me? Okay, now, I want to go to, uh, I didn't plan on reading this verse, but I want to read this verse because this will also help you identify, the Word of God will help you identify the Spirit's movement in your life. There was a time in my life where I was just doing stuff and I had no idea why I was doing it, and then this old pastor with gray hair just came to me and started telling me all this stuff, and I realized, oh my gosh, half the stuff I'm doing is all from the Bible. But I just thought it was natural to me because I just this is what I felt like I should do. And so it's actually the Holy Spirit knows how to like make us do the right thing. <laughs> Let's go to Hebrews 4. I'm just going to read one verse. You guys have probably heard this verse read to you a million times. But I'm going to read it again. Yeah, 412. There you go. That's the servant. Okay. Seeing then... No? Yeah. Okay, 12. For the word of God is quick, which actually means living, and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. Okay. When the soul and the spirit is separated, there's discernment. There's your soul that's not bad. There's the soul that is, it's your mind, will, and emotions. And the spirit of God functions through your soul. It's not the Spirit talking to me and I just get up out of nowhere and start doing things. My mind, will, and emotions come into agreement with the Holy Spirit and then I start acting. But here he's talking about the separation of your soul and spirit. He's talking about your, in, he's talking about like the soul and the spirit. The soul which would be what you want. Yeah. You. Right? But the spirit is what God wants. And so here's what the Word of God does. It is a two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing of the sunder of soul and spirit and to the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, the thoughts are what? The intents are why? The thoughts are what? What you want to do, what you think, what you feel. The intents of the heart are why? The Word of God is a discerner and brings separation to your soul and to your spirit. And when there is the separation of, of, of soul and spirit, that's where discernment sits. Because now you've put your opinion on the shelf and now you're ready for the spirit to quicken you according to the Word. And he, and he puts language to it that the same way the sword, if I stick a sword in you, the sword will sever your joints from your marrow. 
The same way when the Word of God breaks in on someone, it brings a separation. He's saying as sure of a separation is a sword going into you, is as sure and as clear of a separation is the Word of God that will divide soul from spirit, and it's a discerner. And it will tell you what you want to do, and it will tell you why you want to do it. And the Spirit will give you a witness, should you do it or shouldn't you do it. This is very simple stuff here. If you continue, continue, continue. Verse 13 here it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. It's talking about Jesus. But all things are naked and open unto him, unto the eyes of him with whom we do have. Now you don't understand here. <laughs> this is raw. He says all things are naked to his eye. That doesn't mean Jesus walks around and sees everyone naked. What it means is there's nothing that goes past his eye. It's all very plain to him. He sees what's going on. But it's not good enough for him to see what's going on. It says we have him. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Here, Paul, well, I think it's Paul. Some people don't. The writer of Hebrews here is, is, is saying the word of God to my soul and spirit. And it says we have him and everything's naked to his eye. Meaning, we have him so we should see clearly. Seeing that, watch this, we have a great high priest, again, back to him. Wow. See? Do you see, like, what the people in the Bible do? Do you see the difference between what people nowadays are doing, but what this, what this word says? It goes from Jesus to the word to a high priest. It's like, we have him, you know... His perspective, it seems like it's a whole lot more about him than us or me, me, me. Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was all points tested like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, grace is not released until there's a time of need. Grace is released in the time of need. As you step into the time of need, grace is released. I'll give you an example. It's a very small example. I went to Uganda. Everyone said, you're going to have jet lag. You're going to be tired. Blah, 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 blah. I step into Uganda, my allergies immediately are gone, and I step into Uganda with no, with no, not tired at all. Almost more than like, like 23 or 24 hours of traveling, two flights, I step into there, into the grace of God, no jet lag. And I step right into what I'm supposed to do. The point is that grace is released in time of need, and grace in the favor is attached to our assignment. As we step into our assignment, as we discern our assignment, as we discern the thing that God has prepared for us, we step into grace. And when grace is released, we get to do what we're called to do. That's the simple part. But what I love about the writer of Hebrews is he, he starts with talking about the Word. And he starts with talking about Jesus. And then he talks about how Jesus is like touched with our infirmities, meaning there's like nothing that us and Jesus can't relate to. Jesus can relate to like the feelings of being tempted, but yet he was without sin. And so he is the way we overcome. And at the end of how this, is, this, this, this thing gets consummated is let us boldly approach him. You see, it talks about his word. It talks about that we have him and things are naked to his eye. It talks about that we have a great high priest. It talks about the identity of this high priest. He's the son of God. And then it talks about that he felt what we feel, you know, what we feel. And then he says, now let's go after him. And see, here is what real leadership is. Real leadership is taking people to approach the throne. Real leadership is getting people to live from God's perspective. Real leadership is not doing everything for people, but it's teaching how people how to do stuff. Here, I believe, like I said, it was, I believe Paul is writing this, but the writer, it's not that important. It's not saying, let me, your pastor, boldly approach the throne of God, and I'll tell you what he says on Sunday. <laughs> That's not what it is. It's let us Amen. boldly approach the throne. Why? Because Jesus died, why? To bring many sons unto glory. He didn't die to just bring your pastor into glory. 
He didn't just die to bring John or I into glory. He died to bring all of us to the throne of God so that we can live from His perspective. I'm not sure if this makes any sense to you. But what makes sense to me is that I want to know, I don't know about you, I want to know exactly what God wants for my life. I do, you know? And with that being said, I want to do what I'm supposed to do with the cards that I've been dealt. And I want to be found faithful um, with that. And so I think discernment is an absolute must. And um, the challenge we have, you know, moving from maturity or from immaturity to maturity is we can use discernment with everyone else but ourselves or we can apply discernment in its most proper use, which is ourself. And we can allow the Holy Spirit to put our life in order. And as our life is put in order and as we're found faithful, then we walk through life as a blessing to people instead of a curse. And we operate from a different realm. And we're not operating from a realm of lack or a realm of striving or a realm of frustration or a realm of, in a sense, like a feeling of real uncertainty. Although we walk through uncertainties, although we walk through challenges, although the fire of God is real, although the testing is real, although I'm in Haiti and I'm, and I'm sitting there and you know, eight, nine hundred feet away, a building falls on a whole bunch of children in a choir who's singing praise to Jesus. I'll never understand it. I don't understand it. How is it that I'm sleeping after lunch and I live and a bunch of these kids are sitting there playing, their moms are singing, and a building crushes them all? I don't get it. But that situation calibrated my heart to say no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to love God. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to be faithful to God. I'm not going to put God on. I'm not going to put God. I am not God's judge. You know, Christ in us, this is important to understand. I'm in Christ, I'm a son and I'm a servant. Christ in me, he's a Lord and he's a king. And it's good to relate to him that way. I don't put him on the stand, he puts me on the stand. It's real important to understand that our hearts must be calibrated. And we have to adjust and we have to discern things for how they really are and for where they really are. And it's real important that we discern how to move in the moment that we're in. This is a huge thing. Esther, she stewarded the moment. And, and for such a time as this, she walked in prepared. Joseph was sitting in that dungeon. And there was a moment in time where he stepped into that moment. And as he stepped into that moment, he interpreted the dream. The same thing with Daniel. Daniel was prepared for that moment. And he said, I'm not going to be defiled by the king's delicacies. There was people... And all through history, Martin Luther King, he stepped into his moment. He said, I had a dream. You know, I have a dream. There's people. They step into their moment and they discern in the moment where they're supposed to go. In the moment what they're supposed to do. And all of heaven breaks loose behind them when they step into that moment discerning what they're supposed to say. Discerning what they're supposed to do. And I really believe that the more we're faithful and the more we're obedient that those moments become more and more frequent in our life. You see what I'm saying? There was a moment, I have a friend, no one knew who he was. He was a young kid, he wrote a book, he stepped into a moment. As he stepped into that moment, suddenly, now everything, he totally changed in his life in one day. He stepped into that moment. It's important that we step into that moment prepared to steward that moment. Because for some of us, it may be ministry. For others, it may be business. Whatever it is, it's so important that we discern, okay, yeah, we're supposed to ride with this, or no, nah, we're not supposed to do this. We're supposed to wait, or whatever it may be in your life. For each and every one of us, it's different. But the values and the virtues and the truths that we all should live by are the same. Whether, whether it's a minister, whether it's a businessman, it has to be the Word of God. It has to be the uncompromised truth of Jesus Christ. It has to be for the honor and for the glory of His name. It has to be about Him. You see? And, and when we operate from that place, it's so much clearer and so much more easy to see what's really going on. And this is huge because this affects every part of our life. It affects the churches we go to, the relationships we're in. It affects everything. It says that Jesus, in John chapter 2, it says that he did not commit himself to certain people. 
for he knew what was in them. Here is now the Savior of the world not willing to commit himself to a certain group of people because he knew what was in them. See, he operated with discernment even in the relationships that he had, even in the people that he selected. He knew Judas was going to betray him from day one. And he still chose him. And he still chose to love him. And he still gave him power to work miracles. And he still entrusted him with everything. You see, love is a choice. And love doesn't mean we don't have discernment. It means love. It's, it's, it's like, I can't explain it because I don't really have words for it. It's like God loves me in spite of what he knows about me. Amen. And that's the challenge we have with each other. Is Can we love each other through our issues? Can I love you through your weaknesses? Can you love me the fact that I preach too long? You see what I'm saying? Can, can we love each other past our shortcomings? And can we hold the people accountable so that our shortcomings, we grow out of them. You know? The Bible says that we should provoke one another to good works. And um, I believe that when we're in relationships where we're allowed to provoke people, good works will follow it. But when we're not in relationship where provoking people can even be a possibility, I don't believe much good works will come from it. The key is to discern who we're supposed to be in relationship with and to be in relationship with those people and to walk forward with those people. And um, I really believe that, I don't believe that you guys are here by accident and um, I don't believe that we're doing what we're doing by accident. I really believe it's very intentional to an all-knowing God.